I, I just wanted to take a second to formally uh, introduce ourselves. We are NLYA. We are New Life Young Adults. We are a, uh, a student ministry on the campus, here on the campus of a and Corpus Christi. We're a student organization uh, dedicated to you, dedicated to the Islanders, uh, to, to reveal Jesus to you and to walk with you in your journey of faith and to encourage you in the Lord. So one, yes, we have one night is one night, but we're not here for one night. We're here all semester and the next. We're here for you, Tammy CC. We're here to serve you. We're here to share the love of God with you. We're a student organization. At the same time, we are also the young adult community of New Life Church here in Corpus Christi. New Life Church is located uh, 1241 Flower Bluff Drive. If you're driving to the beach, like the, like the real beach, it's the big tent on the right. You can't, and so none of you guys have driven to the beach yet because you know what I'm talking about. When you go to the beach, inevitably, we are the giant tent on the right across from Walmart. And so NLYA is the college, uh, it's the young adult ministry of New Life Church. Uh, and we, we started in 2015, always had a heart for Tammy CC. We love Tammy CC. We believe that God loves the Island University, that God has a plan for the Island University. We believe that none of you guys are here on accident. And we believe that God wants to move on the Island University. And he doesn't want to do it mainly through me on this stage in this microphone. He mainly wants to do it through you. And I believe that God's going to move tonight. Well, before everybody's butts get sore, I'm going to get into it. I have one question for you, one night, 2024. And that's this. How do you know that you have had an encounter with God? How do you know? Statistically in America, specifically young people, people are more spiritual than ever and less religious than ever. The statistics show this. People, when they fill out a survey, they identify themselves as spiritual. More people identify themselves as spiritual than ever. Like, raise your hand if you consider yourself spiritual. Yeah, you know that there's something to you other than your physical body. You have a soul, you have a spirit. More spiritual than ever, but less religious than ever. Here's what this means. It means that people in America are more open to supernatural experiences than they ever have been before. But they're less willing to define those, those experiences. So people will go on different journeys and, and walks and they'll take different drugs to try to have some sort of encounter with the supernatural. And they're not looking for anything specific. They just want to touch from the world that's beyond our world. They just want to experience something that's more, they know that there's something more than what we, we can see and feel. And they just want to touch from it. And they really don't care who it is or what it looks like. They just want something. And so many people, because of this aspect of our culture, many people will claim to have experiences, encounters with God. They'll claim to hear his voice. They'll claim to experience his presence. They'll, they'll claim that he tells them things or he shows them things or he gives them answers for their life. Many people have different definitions for who God is and, and they'll, they'll share their different experiences. And so my question is, all these people are having these so-called experiences. How do you know that you had an encounter with God? Not a little G God, not a spirit that appeared to you when you had sleep paralysis in the middle of the night in your bed. Not shapes and colors that appeared to you when you may have been experimenting with psychedelics or a feeling that you got at a concert. No, not, not a spirit, not a horoscope, not a tingling when you rub a crystal. How do you know that you had an encounter with the one true living God? Because there's only one. There's only one creator. There's only one maker of heaven and earth. 
I can tell you how you can know that you have had an encounter with the one true living God. There's three signs, there's three indications that you have had an encounter with the one true living God. And for the sake of clarity, I'm gonna list them out on the front end and then I'm gonna tell a story. Does that sound good? You with me still? All right. Evidence number one, that you have had an encounter with the one true living God. It's the, they're all C words, okay? Because I like alliteration. There's a drone above us. I hope it's friendly. <laughs> I don't, yeah, okay. Um, the first word is this, the first C word is this, conviction. When you get in the presence of the one true living God, the Bible says that he is holy. The Bible says that he is holy. The Bible says that he dwells in unapproachable light. He's almost described like the sun, right? It's like the sun is beautiful from a distance, but the closer that you get, it starts to heat up. And God is the same way. When you, when you get around God, the things in your life that you used to tolerate, the things that in your life you used to dabble in, the things in your life that you used to even indulge in, all of a sudden they become a problem. You don't exactly know why, but you feel like things need to change. That's the, no, that's the first sign that you've had an encounter with the one true living God. The second sign is this. It's cleansing. Cleansing. The Bible says that there's forgiveness of sin for all who repent. The Bible says that the Father is not willing that any should perish but that all should come into repentance. Here's what this means. When you think of God and you think about what his ultimate goal is in your life, his goal is not to put a lid on your life. His goal is not to destroy you and his goal is not to remove your, fu your fun. His goal is to remove everything in your life that hinders his love. Because we were created to experience the love of God. We were made by him for him. And the thing about sin is sin, we tend to think of sin as breaking the rules. Ultimately, sin is allowing or embracing anything that hinders our ability to experience the love of God. And so because he loves us, because he's so unwilling that any of us should perish without knowing him, that when you get in the presence of God, there's a cleansing that happens where he starts to remove The last C, the evidence that you have had an encounter with the one true living God, is there's a commissioning. There's an assignment. There's a mission. That when you get around the presence of God, it's not just, oh, things need to change in my lifestyle. It's things need to change about what I live for. My dreams need to change. My aspirations need to change. You get clarity about your purpose. You start to realize what you're actually here for. And you start to get a vision for it. And you start to get a desire to go and do it. And you get permission from God himself. Say, where he says, go and do it, and I'll back you. Commissioning. One of the greatest examples in the Bible of a true encounter with God where all of these three things are present is found in Isaiah 6, and typically at one night, I'll kind of paraphrase the Bible, but this story is so powerful, I, I wanted to read it almost verbatim. To give you some context, this is about a young man, Isaiah, he's about 18 years old. He lived in Jerusalem around 740 BC. And Isaiah, he was the son of a priest. He's 18, lives in Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem, and he's the son of a priest. Think of it this way. He's, he's, the, he's a pastor's kid. And he's a, pre, he's a son of a priest in the temple of Jerusalem. So he's a pastor's kid of the largest church in the world. <laughs> and he doesn't, he's not just a pastor's kid, but he works with his dad as a priest in the temple. And so he's one day he's working his job as a priest, and, and this job as a priest, even though he was supposed to be encountering God, it was kind of dry and it was kind of boring. He was in the temple where God's presence was supposed to be, 
but it was just, it was just work for him. It was, it was mundane. He would change some of the, uh, some of the equipment on the altar. He would swap things out. He would make sure that there was all these different, uh, aspects of the temple that he had to manage and help. And it was all for him. It was all kind of boring and it was all kind of dry until one day he has an encounter with the one true living God. Here's what it says. It says, it was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. So one moment, Isaiah's doing his thing, his boring job, and the next minute, the roof rips off of the temple where he's working and a throne appears, a giant, lofty, high, great, bright, mighty throne appears before him. And he says he sees the Lord sitting on this throne and the train of his robe fills the temple. His presence fills the temple. Have you ever met somebody where they're so charismatic, their personality just fills any room that they walk into? It's like no matter where they go, no matter what room they walk into, they're the life of the party. Does anybody know somebody like that? Is anybody that person? Okay, everyone here is boring, I guess. <laughs> okay, th this was this times a hundred. This giant throne, the train of his robes filled the temple. His presence is filling the temple. His being, his essence, you can't look away. You can't ignore. It's, it's as if nothing else is happening or has ever happened in this space until right now. And then it says, attending him, attending the throne. And just in my imagination right now, I'm picturing a giant throne over East Lawn. It just helps me imagine this. Attending the throne, there's four beings, angelic beings around the throne. They're called seraphim. It means burning ones. These flaming beings are flying around the throne. And it says that they covered, that they had six wings and that with two of the wings, they covered their face and two of the wings, they covered their feet and two wings, they flew. So similar to the way that these seagulls are flying around. I hope they don't poop on anybody. I never thought about that till right now. Every year I see it and I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. But right now I'm just worried about the girl's hair. Y'all are going to be thinking about that the rest of the night now. So this throne, the angelic beings, they're flying. The throne is big. It's bright. The train of the road. The angelic beings, they're flying. They're on fire. They have all these wings. And it says that as they flew, they were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Just time and time again, they're looking at each other and there's nothing else that they can say. They look at him, then they look at each other, then they look at him, then they look at each other, then they look at him, then they look at each other and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with the glory. And it says that their voices shook the temple and its foundations. And the entire building was filled with smoke. This is intense. He's seeing this with his eyes. It's not a hallucination. It's real. He's seeing it. And this was his response. This was the first thing that he said. He says these three words. He says, woe is me. Woe is me. Another way of saying that is like, I'm done. It's all over for me. I'm doomed. I'm never going to survive this. I am ruined. I wish I could go back to my life before I had this encounter, before I saw what I'm seeing right now. This is too much. This is too intense. I am not excited right now. Like, like many of you, when we were worshiping, you were, were sensing the presence of God and it felt really good. You felt peace. You felt joy. You felt freedom. He didn't feel any of those things. He was terrified. He says, woe is me, woe to me. I am ruined. Here's why. He says, because I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips, yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. 
the immediate first response of an encounter with the one true living God is conviction. He was in the temple. He was in church every Sunday. He had the Bible memorized. He was working for a pastor. His dad was a pastor. He thought he was fine. He thought everything was all right. He thought him and God were good until God showed up. And then he realized everything isn't good. And he became painfully aware of the gap between him and God. There's sometimes where we need to become painfully aware of the gap between us and God. We live in an era right now where people would really very much like to think that they are God. They would like to believe that they can decide for themselves between right and wrong. They like to believe that they could decide for themselves what truth is, that we can decide for ourselves what is true, what is good, what is right. We can decide for ourselves what love is. We can decide for ourselves what is an acceptable expression of sexuality. We can decide for ourselves whether or not a baby has the right to live. We can decide for ourselves what a woman is. And listen, I am not here to tell you how to live your life, but I am here to say that there are certain things that are above our pay grade. There's certain things that are reserved for God and God alone, and we don't get a say. There's times where we need to be reminded of the gap between us and God, where he gets to be God and we get to be us. Because when we try to be God, it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. And it would behoove our nation to remember that. I said it would behoove us as a nation to remember that God is God and we are not. This is the revelation that Isaiah has. He sees the gap between him and God and he is painfully aware of that gap and he's not okay with it. And so in that moment, he's expecting to be destroyed. He is expecting to be absolutely annihilated. He's like, I have sin. I'm in God's presence. I'm five feet away from the sun right now. I'm going to be destroyed. Any second now, he's just kind of eyes closed, his face on the floor. He's crying. He's weeping. There's tears and snot. It's ugly. And he's just waiting any minute now to be killed, to die in the presence of God. But that's not what happens. It says that one of the flying creatures, one of the seraphim, one of the burning ones, they went to the altar that was near the throne and they grabbed a flaming coal from the altar and they flew over to Isaiah. And while he's curled up in the fetal position on the floor, crying, waiting to be annihilated. The seraphim goes close to him and I'm sure he can feel the warmth increase as the burning one gets closer. And he's like, any minute now, any minute now, this guy's going to end me. I just, I give up. I, I've, I've come to terms with it. I'm toast. But instead of destroying him, the seraphim takes this coal, this burning coal, and he does something very interesting. He touches Isaiah's lips. He takes the burning coal and he touches the exact place of Isaiah's need. God shows up. Isaiah realizes it. He says, I'm undone. I have unclean lips. When you get in the presence of God, you realize you, your need for God. You realize you start to become aware of areas in your life that are not right with God. And we think, a lot of us have kept a distance, we've stayed clear from anywhere where we could be in the presence of God because we are afraid that he's just going to condemn and destroy us. But that's not what happens. Instead, the angel comes and he takes the coal and he touches the exact area, the exact problem in Isaiah's life. 
He touches his lips, and here's what he says. He says, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed, and your sins are forgiven. What a roller coaster. He goes from, I'm going to die right now, to, I just got forgiven of everything I've ever done. He went from, God's about to kill me, to, I am right before God. The Bible says that we rejoice when we know that we have peace with God. There's some people that they're going around and they're looking for enjoyment and all these different things. And you don't need another good time. You don't need another sip. You don't need more entertainment. You need the peace of God. That, that realization that your sins have been forgiven, that you've been cleansed, that you've been made clean, that you're right with God, that you're a friend of God. Nothing, can, nothing in the world can substitute for that peace. And many of us, again, walking around and we're trying to fix depression or anxiety or just this dark cloud that we've been under and we're trying to find things to fix it and you don't realize that, you can have peace with God and it gives you joy that no one can steal. So there was conviction, there was cleansing, and then the last thing, here's what it says. It says, then I heard the Lord. So Isaiah had this whirlwind. He realizes he's forgiven. He's super confused. I want to point out that he didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't ask God to forgive him. He didn't ask for forgiveness. Sometimes, I, well really, I'm here, I, I wanna make this statement. Ultimately, it's not about asking God for forgiveness. It's about humbling ourselves before him. Isaiah didn't ask to be cleansed. God didn't need his permission. He just needed his humility. And there's times where we will go to God seeking forgiveness, but we still want to live on the throne of our own life. The Bible doesn't call that humility. The Bible calls that pride. And the Bible says that God resists the proud. So you mess up and you acknowledge it. That's, that's beautiful. We should acknowledge when we mess up. And you go to God and you genuinely want him to forgive you. But you want him to forgive you just so that you'll feel better and just so that you'll go to heaven, but you have no intention of him being on that throne of your life. And I'm telling you, if you go to God with that posture, you will not receive forgiveness. He will resist you because he does not share that throne and he won't share it with anyone. It's less important that you ask for forgiveness. It's more important that you come to God in humility. And because Isaiah was forced into humility, he was eligible for cleansing. That's the prerequisite. You don't have to come and clean yourself up. You don't go to a doctor when you're healthy. You go to a doctor when you're sick. You don't get into the shower when you're clean. You get in the shower when you're dirty. No one says, man, I'm about to hop in the shower. Let me take a bath real quick. That doesn't make any sense. No, it has a specific purpose. God wants to cleanse us. You don't have to come to him cleaned up. All you have to do is come to him in humility, recognizing your need. And so Isaiah, he's cleaning himself up off the floor. He's wiping his tears. He's wiping the dust. He's wiping the snot, and he's just trying to, like, Get his composure, remember where he is. He was gonna die a second ago, now he's gonna live, and he feels better than he ever has. And all of a sudden, he hears this booming voice from the throne, and it's a different voice from the beings that were flying. It's a different, distinct voice. He's never heard a voice like this before. It's a booming voice, and it says, who will go for us? Who will go as my messenger? In other words, who will live for me? 
Who will be my expression? Who will be my light in the darkness? Who is going to demonstrate my goodness and my faithfulness to lost, hurting, and broken people? Who will go? And without hesitation, Isaiah takes a step forward. Isn't it funny how when you're cleansed, you want to come closer to God and not run away from him? A second ago, he wanted to run out the room, which he couldn't because he was paralyzed. Now he's stepping toward the throne and he's standing. And he says, Lord, here I am. Send me. I will go. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll say whatever you tell me to say. I will live my life for you. I am ruined for anything else. I can't unexperience what I experience. And if there's even a chance, God, that you will use me to do for somebody else what you did for me, then I will go. If there's even a chance, if you'll touch one life through me, here I am. I'll live for you. I'll leave those old things in the past. I'll leave my sin in the past. I'll leave my shame in the past. I'll leave my guilt in the past. And I'll live for you. This is how you know you've had an encounter with the one true living God. There's conviction of sin. There's cleansing. And there's a commissioning. There's a sending out. A few hundred years later, God broke into the, the, the story again, the, the author of the story, he stepped onto the page again, but instead of this booming throne of power and fire and might and intensity, he came as a baby, born of a virgin, lowly, humble, gentle, meek. He came as a man like you or me. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. He met the requirement of righteousness that we could never meet. The requirement's perfection. You can't meet it. I can't meet it. He did. And you know what's funny? Even though he was just a man, he elicited the same response from people that God did when he appeared to Isaiah. Except he didn't need all the fireworks. He would show up to people. He shows up to Peter as he's fishing, and he says, why don't you throw your nets over to the right side of the boat, the other side of the boat? He says, Lord, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught a thing, but because you told me to, I'll do it anyway. I'll humor you. And so he throws the net over, and fish begin to fill his net so that the boat begins to sink, and he realizes this isn't just a good day on the boat. This is a miracle. This man isn't just a man, and he throws himself at the feet of Jesus, and he says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It didn't take all the fireworks. It just took an encounter with God. It looks different for different people in different situations, but it produces the same result. And he would go through cleansing people of their sicknesses and their diseases. Specifically, there was a man with leprosy, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, Lord, uh, uh, you're not even supposed to be near me. You're not even supposed to touch me. I'm contagious. I have this skin disease. It spreads to anyone that I touch. But if you're willing, I believe that you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I'm willing. Be clean. And, and like the angel with the coal with Isaiah, he touches the man, and he was cleansed of his disease. There was cleansing. And as Jesus gathered with followers from time to time, he would give them the authority of his power, and he would say, listen, I want you to go into city after city. I want you to tell people about me. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to uh, heal the sick. I want you to raise the dead. I I'm giving you the authority of my name to go and to bless these cities and to show the goodness of God to these cities. And they would go. Anywhere Jesus went, there was conviction. There was cleansing. There was commissioning. And at the end of his earthly ministry, at the end of his perfectly righteous life, he offered up his life. He allowed himself to be crucified on a cross. He allowed himself. He says, nobody takes my life. I give it. I lay it down. 
And people thought that they were just killing an innocent man, but they didn't realize that it was God's plan to lay on him the punishment for our sins because the life is in the blood. And so when Jesus' blood was shed, his perfect life was poured out for us. There was an exchange that was now possible where his life could now be available to you so that when you put your faith and you receive the covering of his blood, when his blood touches you like the coal of Isaiah, when his blood touches you, God looks at you and he says, clean. He says, righteous. Because the life is in the blood. When Jesus shed his blood, he was offering his life, his life for ours. And it's proof that he really was who he says he was, that he really could do what he said he could do. God raised him up on the third day. And God seated him at the right hand of the Father. Jesus ascended. But that wasn't the end of the story. Because if it was the end of the story, there would be no reason for us to gather. And there would be no reason for me to be talking about God encounters. Because there would be no reason to expect to have an encounter with God if Jesus left and that's the end of the story, then that means God encounters are over. And we're just left to our own devices. But Jesus said, I am leaving, but I have not left you as orphans. For I am sending my Holy Spirit. Me, I'm a man. I can only be in one place at one time. He said, it's better for you that I go so that he can come because he's not limited by time and space. He can't only be in one place at one time. He can be in everywhere at once. And God sends his Holy Spirit on the followers of Jesus. And it wasn't something where they had to be like, okay, did we get it? I, I believe him, I, I trust him, but I, 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 can't, I think we got it. Well, this Bible verse says that we have the Holy Spirit, so we, we must have it. That's not what they said. It says that they waited in the upper room until the sound of a rushing wind came blowing through the building and flames of fire came down and descended on their heads. And they began praising God in different languages. They began crying out and worshiping and lifting their hands. They began to be moved, physically moved, convicted, cleansed, commissioned all at once and they begin to praise God and they begin to preach and the people outside of the room, there was about 3,000 outside of this room, heard them praising God, heard them preaching the gospel. And it says that as they were preaching, did people go, oh, that's a good idea. As they're preaching about Jesus, as they're saying, hey, just so you know, God sent his son to deal with our sin, and God has appointed his son as the judge of all people. It's Jesus. There's no other way to the Father except through Jesus. He's not a way. He's one way. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's not Krishna. It's not crystals. It's not your horoscope. It's not just making it up and trying to figure it out. It's Jesus. So they're, they're preaching to the crowd. They're saying, guys, Jesus is the only way. And Peter, he even gets up and he says, God proved that Jesus was his son. It says that God publicly endorsed him through signs and wonders, through healing the sick, raising the blind eyes being opened, deaf ears being unstopped. And I can only imagine Peter in his mind, because when you preach, you're talking, like I'm talking to you guys, but I'm also thinking. I can almost imagine Peter thinking as he's saying, 
He's trying to explain to them what's happening. He's saying, guys, Jesus is the only way. He said, God publicly endorsed Jesus with signs and wonders. And I just wonder if in the back of his head he's thinking, crap, Jesus is gone. Jesus isn't here. He, he ascended. He left. We don't have him here to do the stuff to prove that he is who he says he is. How are we going to convince these people that this is the truth? We can't do it through argument. And we can't do it through scientific evidence. And Peter's just going, okay, I'm just going to tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may. And so he, uh, he's, he, just, he just rolls with it. He says, Jesus, the Son of God, God publicly endorsed him. God proved that he was the one true Son of God by raising him from the dead. And here's what it says. It says that as Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon those who were listening. That without a throne in a temple and without the man Jesus Christ on the earth, these people had a God encounter. And just like before, there was conviction. They said, brothers, what must I do? Understand the background of this. The crowd that they're speaking to doesn't know who they are. They came in from out of town. A lot of us here, we're not from Corpus Christi. We came in from out of town. We're strangers to one another. You, you don't know me. You don't know my reputation. I really haven't given you any reason to trust me. They had no reason to trust Peter. And yet as he was speaking, it says that their hearts were cut to the quick. Their hearts were pierced by the words that he was saying. They felt it. They didn't have to guess. Oh, okay, well, think about what you said. No, no, no. They knew what he was saying was true because the Holy Spirit was upon them. And they began to become convicted. And they said, brothers, what, what must we do to be saved? And this was Peter's response. He said, repent from your sin. Be baptized for the forgiveness, for the cleansing of your sin. And receive the Holy Spirit. And so that's what they did. They responded to the conviction. They responded to God's invitation of cleansing. There wasn't going to be an angel to come without permission. No, it took action this time. They had to step up and obey. So they did something about the conviction. They went, they were baptized, they were cleansed from their sin. And then the Bible says, as evidence, as proof that it was real, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that tonight, many of us are gonna have an encounter with God. I believe there, there's gonna be conviction. There probably already is. You're thinking of areas in your life that aren't right with God, and you're feeling like they need to change. You're looking for an opportunity for cleansing, for forgiveness, to be made right with God. Here's what I love about the, uh, what the Bible says about how you can be right with God. It says if you want to be right with God, that opportunity, it's not far away. You don't have to go through some crazy ritual or classes or certain church attendance or anything like that. To be right with God, it says that it's on your lips and in your heart. Here's what it means. It means that whoever believes in their heart that Jesus was raised from the dead and whoever confesses with their mouth that he is Lord, the Holy Spirit will come and will forgive their sins and cleanse them. And you can walk away with a clear conscience. And so we're going to go in a, into a time of response in a moment. And again, I believe that many of you, you're going to have an encounter with God. The Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to touch you. The Holy Spirit is going to publicly endorse. He's going to the same thing that God did for Jesus. He's going to do for us on this lawn tonight. The Holy Spirit is here. And when he moves, he moves in power. That means some of you that are sick, you're going to get healed tonight. Some of you that have chronic diseases or sports injuries, 
The Spirit of God is going to touch you, and He's going to cleanse you, and He's going to heal your body. Some of you are going to get delivered from anxiety and depression tonight. You're going to be free for the rest of your life. Not because of me. I have no power. I just know the one who does. And I know he shows up to those who call upon his name. The Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word saved, it means rescued, saved, healed, delivered, set free. It's all available. All it requires is us humbling ourselves before God and calling on his name. And you can leave here tonight completely different. But before we do that, I want to invite a few people up to share their testimony because it's not just Isaiah. It's not just the people that encountered the man Jesus. And it's not just the people that heard the preaching of Peter that have experienced an encounter with God and what comes from it. It's still happening today, right now, in our midst, in our generation. I want to welcome my man Jamal up to the stage. This light is bright. What's the word, y'all? So look, I can keep y'all out here till midnight, but I ain't even gonna do that. Um, but I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna keep it real with y'all, man. The Lord really put this upon me. Everybody, is y'all phone percent on 100 percent I guarantee you, y'all sometimes forget to put on low battery mode. So three years, three and a half years ago, my brother passed away, right? And when he passed away, I went into the stage of just like depression. And I was a senior in high school, COVID hit, and I just didn't know what to do with my life. And at that point, my battery for the Lord really just drained. I didn't look at him for nothing. I didn't even seek him. I just was just living my life, real arrogance of just living in the world. I come to, um, after he passed away, I quit playing basketball. I just, I ended up quitting. I've been playing basketball since I was four. And I just, I just ended up quitting. And I just wanted to do a sport, so I picked up track and field. A lot of you guys didn't know, I used to do track and field here. I, used to, I ran track and field here for two years. I did high jump. And with those two years, I felt like I just knew something was missing. Something, something was just, it, it was gone. There was nothing there. Like, of course, I was a Division I athlete. I was happy. I was like, yeah, you know, but... Something, something was still missing. My second year, I ended up getting injured. Going into that summer, I was just hurt. And I went to the doctors, and I had two cysts on my spine. My knee was still messed up. My fat pad was just all torn up. I was walking around like I was old. And during that stage, in July, I started just really just picking up weed, start smoking really, really heavy. And in the back, y'all hear me in the back? All right, so I started picking up weed and I started smoking really, really heavy. And I knew my ma Duke, she would not be happy like at all. Like, so I'm just sitting there like I was not raised to be, you know, just picking up weed, just smoking it, and just walking around class, walking around campus, just walking wherever I went. My eyes was halfway open. I thought I was a cool guy. And when I came to one night last year, I sat down, and I was in the same spot I was in. I just sat down, and I got touched by the Lord. I did. I, he met me. But I got conformed by the world. I didn't want to get baptized. I didn't want to give my life to the Lord because I thought I was still the cool kid. So fast forward, we going through from, all, from last one night all the way up to January, I'm still in the stage. It's, it's just a loop over and over and over. All I'm doing is just getting high, going to class, getting high, going to class. I quit. I quit track. Like, it was just a stage of depression where I just wanted to drop out of school. Nobody even knew. I didn't even tell my mom. Like, I don't talk to nobody. Nobody knew I wanted to drop out of school. Here comes January, right, right after my birthday, a guy comes into my job, and when he comes into my job, he gives me a mustard seed. And if, my, if anybody doesn't know what a mustard seed is, it's, probably, it's one of the smallest seeds, but it will grow the biggest tree. 
he comes back in and gives me a devotional. And I sat there and I'm like, man, this is really like the Lord tugging on my heart. Like, like, okay. So after he gave me a devotional going on later on, one of my good friends, uh, I seen him when I was playing intramurals basketball. He said, hey, you coming to church this Sunday? And I was like, you know, I guess that's a sign from the Lord. I was like, yes, I'm coming to church. That Sunday, I went to church. And after I went to church, I sat there and really just felt the Lord. Like, he just touched me. I turned back. I repent from everything. And I got baptized that Sunday. I rebaptized and felt the Lord right there. I, and then it's the phenomenal thing about it is I came out of the water feeling good. Like, I felt wonderful. All burdens, everything was just gone. Like, there was nothing there. A few weeks later, I go, to, I go to nights, and I'm just asking for, like, healing. Like, Lord, just heal me. Just heal me. After nights I get healed, I go play basketball. I'm instantly, I'm dunking the ball again. I'm, I'm jumping higher than I've ever been. If anybody know me, like, I was hobbling around like I was old. I couldn't move, but I was healed. I have no more cysts on my back. My knee is gone. Like, the pain's gone. Then I go home, and after I go home, I, I, I see my bong, right? I just see her sitting there, and I was like, you know, maybe one last time. And this is after I got out the water. Like, I'm repentant. Like, this is one last time. I go there, the lighter won't light. It won't light. And the Lord's like, no, you're not doing this. I tried again. Wouldn't light. I was like, okay. One more time. Wouldn't light. And I said, okay, cool. So I just left it alone. I went back. I threw it away. And I asked the Lord, I said, that's what you want from me? He was like, yes. I don't want you to do this no more. You're free from everything. You're free from depression. You're free from your injuries. You're free. And I sat there. And all I could do was just give him the glory. Just it. Just to give him the glory. This past summer, I get touched by the Lord at this, at this event. I'm able to go around and I'm able to heal people through his power. It's not I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me that he says in Galatians 2.20. A blind lady at my job, she instantly, she described what color shoes she had. She described my height. She described my age. She described who I was. And that was the Lord really speaking through her and she accepted Christ right then and there. So I just want you guys to know that if he can do it for me, he can do it for you guys. It doesn't matter what circumstances you're in. You could be at the, the top of your life right now, or you could be at the bottom. He still will free you from any burdens, I'm telling you. And what he says in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 10, 13, he says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out that you can, uh, sorry, my bad, endure. No matter what temptations, you get a temptation to do something that's not fruitful, pick up the Bible. You get a temptation that you know, just pray. Because there's only one way and that's your way. Okay, hey guys, I'm Mallory. You're gonna have to bear with me. My voice is going out. So just, good thing I have a mic. Okay, um, so I moved here in 2019. I had no business coming here. I wasn't coming to college here. I was just kind of like running away from what I had back home. Um, nothing bad, it was just like I was tired of it. And so I come to Corpus and I eventually start coming to a m Corpus like a semester later. Um, and immediately I join a sorority and I just get, I get caught up. At first I didn't have any friends and then I immediately have so many friends, like a plethora of friends um, that just want to invite me to go to parties, go get drunk, um, just do stuff I had already been doing. So it wasn't like, no, don't let me do it. It was like, I was like, oh, I'm so down, let's go. Um, and so I immediately just get caught up in all of it. And it wasn't, that was my freshman year. It wasn't until my senior year, my last semester of senior year. So I had like three and a half years of that. Um, it was the, it was like right before Christmas break. And 
I just get so burdened with um, stress, this like weird stress. I never really had stress. I was always a busy person, but I could handle it. Um, and it was just this stress that was not like, not natural. It was like, I couldn't go out places. I was just like getting so distorted. Like people would talk to me and I literally couldn't hear a single word. So many things were going on in my head. Um, like I literally started hearing voices. Like if you ever walked into like a really like crowded cafeteria, that's what was going on in my head. Like I literally could not like understand what was going on. I thought it was going crazy. Like there was a point where I asked my mom and I was like, does our insurance cover therapy? Like I need therapy. I need something. I literally thought I was schizophrenic. Like I was looking up um, like what was going on and it was really like schizophrenia. And I was like, I'm not schizophrenic. Like what is going on? And so I told my mom and I was like, I don't know if I need therapy or if I need like a mental hospital. And I was so, I was fully ready to commit myself to a mental hospital, like willingly, so I could get away from whatever this was. Like I knew it wasn't me, and I knew it wasn't um, who I was, and I just wanted to be free from it. And I remember sitting and like crying in my room, being like, I want peace. I just need peace. I couldn't sleep. I woke up every hour on the hour, and somehow I was fine. Um, but I just, I literally could not get a good night's sleep for a long time. Like you can check my Apple Watch sleep patterns. It was messed up. Um, and so I eventually go to my friend. She has known the Lord for a long time, but I thought I had too. And she was like, bro, you want peace? Like the Lord will give you peace. And I was honestly shocked because I was like, I know God. I know the Lord. And she was like, you want peace, like the Lord will give you peace. And I honestly was taken aback, but at this point I was desperate. Like I couldn't pay for a therapist. I really couldn't, I couldn't like take the reputation of going to a mental hospital. And so um, I was like, okay, you say the Lord will give me peace. I'm gonna try it out. Like we'll see how this goes. And so I end up going to church. I come back to Corpus. I end up going to church all by myself. Like it was super not normal of me to go anywhere by myself. I was, always had like a posse with me. And so I went to church by myself because my roommate was like, I don't believe in God. And I was like, okay, well I'm trying to, I need something. I'll go by myself. And I ended up going by myself. And I distinctly remember the specific sermon obviously because it marked me and it changed me um that was like my conviction honestly um he preached about needing new wine skin for new wine um and luke chapter 5 verse 37 and 38 it says and no one puts new wine into old wine skins or else the new wine will burst the wine skins and be spilled and the wine skins will be ruined but the new wine must be put into new wine skins and both are preserved and to me, that meant, like, I needed to take off this. If I wanted to, for my sake, if I wanted to be okay, I had to take off whatever I had on. Um, and right before, in that verse, Luke 35, it talks about how no one puts a new piece of garment on an old one. And so I'm trying to be this new person. I'm trying to not have all of this. I'm trying to have the peace. I'm trying to have this new thing that I wanted, I didn't want to be me. Um, I had to take off that old garment. I had to get a new wineskin so the Lord can come and do what he wanted to do in my life. Um, so immediately after church, I go home and I'm like, okay, like, I don't know what I need to do, but I know that the Lord has been highlighting stuff in my life. And I was, it was specifically like going out downtown and specifically like drinking and going over that guy's house and stuff like that and so I immediately just start taking it away I don't say no all the time but I start just taking it away like oh I don't know like I'm gonna go to bed early y'all have fun though I'll be your DD if you want me to um but I kind of just took it away a little bit slowly but surely I was taking it away and there ended up being an NLYA night 
kind of like this one, but like a little bit smaller. It's like our monthly ones. Um, I end up going, it's January, it was freezing cold, and I don't really remember what was preached about, but I do remember I was so convicted, and I was like, this whole, like, I can live in my sorority party, uh, sexual sin life, but I can also go to church and have my church friends. Um, and it wasn't working. Like, I still, like, I had, like, I had, like, some sort of peace. Like, I had a hope because I knew, like, I was no, like, getting to know who Jesus was. But I was still, there was still something I was, like, holding on to back here. And so I get so convicted. And I'm like, I can't do any of that. He's telling me I can't do any of this. Like, and I don't want to. Like, my heart started changing. And my heart started to hate what the Lord hated and what I had done to myself. And I started, like I felt bad for myself. I was like, why would I do that to myself? Why would I leave, lead this life that led, ultimately led to nothing? Why would I lead this life that I had false hope in people or in myself or in this future I had planned? And I ultimately like took all that away. I was like, no, I blocked the numbers that needed to be blocked, um, all of that. And that night, after I was so convicted and the Lord started moving in my heart and just, like, taking things away, I was like, I need to go all in. And so that night, I literally got baptized at Hector P. That You walk by every time you go to the library. I got baptized in 20-degree weather, freezing cold. And I got out of that water. I was changed. Obviously, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't this, like, instant change I got out of the water and I was like I'm cold like it wasn't like wow like I feel so good I'm like I need to go change I'm freezing so I go home and that's when I block the numbers that need to be blocked I um, just totally decided just in my heart I was like no I'm not doing that anymore I've I want these voices to stop I don't want to be labeled as a mental health victim like I that's not who I am. I'm a child of God. And so I changed my, I just totally changed. I repented from my sins and I turned to God. And when I tell you the next day I woke up, I slept the whole night. I never woke up. I didn't wake up once. I slept the whole night. I woke up. I had peace. The voices were not in my head. The the only voice I heard was the Lord, that still small voice that was like, thank you, that was like, your yes is so beautiful, that yes that I had, and I was like, no, I'm turning away, that yes, and I just felt like a nod from the Father that was like, I'm proud of you, and I don't know if any of you guys need that nod, but it's there for you, if you are a child of God, if you receive him in your life, he will give you that nod that you are needing, not from other people, not from um, your earthly parents, not from a mentor, but like your Abba Father will give you that nod if that's what you're wanting, I just felt like I had to say that, Um, but I will say the sky was bluer, the grass was greener. Like when I tell you that I had a different lens, a different view of the world, I stopped walking past people and I started seeing them as that's a person that needs Jesus, that's a person that needs a word of encouragement. And ever since I've started walking with the Lord and just giving him my yes, I have seen people healed. I have seen myself healed. I have seen people delivered and set free from bondage, from depression, from anxiety, from so many things that they didn't even know they had, they had in their life. I've seen people baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've been at the feet of Jesus. And when I tell you there's nothing that compare, I've seen too much. I know too much to go back to that old wineskin, to go back to that old garment. At the end of that verse, in Luke um, chapter 5, it says, And no one having um, drunk old wine that merely desires a new, and says the old better. So I was stuck in this religion, weird view of the world, and I, my compromise was I thought I was a Christian, and I really viewed people that 
were raising their hands, that were getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, I really viewed them as weird. And honestly, I used to go on campus and I would see NOIA and I was like, those are the weird people, like don't go over there. And now I guess I am one of those weird people. But when I say that you put on that new wine skin, you can't go back. You can't go back. If you truly have accepted the Lord, you have the Holy Spirit, you can't go back. You can't be like the old is better. You can't. And when that verse they're talking about the Pharisees going like they're weirded out by all this stuff going on. Um, but guys, you can't go back. I've seen too much. I know too much. I can't go back. And whenever you take that step, like all of that stuff that's happened to me can happen to you. And it will in a greater measure in Jesus name it will. And I have faith that the Lord is going to do something in your life exactly what you need him to. And so I'm not going to take any much of your time. There's somebody else, but the Lord's going to do it. His promises do not come up void. So uh, we're going to go into a time of response. Um, we have got one more testimony, but what I want to do, I want to ask us all if if you'd stand up. I had a feeling I was going to hear something like that. <laughs> All right, do me a favor. Just kind of shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Okay. Here's what I want to do. Okay, here's what I want to do. Um, what's your name in the Ranger shirt? Sarah? Okay. <laughs> booing? Why are we booing Sarah? <laughs> oh, boo Rangers. Oh, okay. I was like, what does Sarah do to you? <laughs> What's going on? That was, that was wild. Okay. Um, so from Sarah this way, I'm going to ask you guys all the way down. I'm going to part the Red Sea all the way down. I'm going to ask you to take like three steps this way. And then what's your name? Kieran. And from Kieran. Yeah, give it over Kieran. No booing. <laughs> That's awesome. And Sarah. Yeah. Okay. And then you guys get the gist from Kieran on. Kind of make your way this way. Okay. Okay. So as we go from this last testimony into the response time, we're going to give you guys an opportunity to do a couple of things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to give you guys an opportunity to confess your faith in Jesus and receive water baptism. This is what, what, this is what water baptism is. Water baptism is a public declaration that my old life is dying and I'm going to be raised to new life with Jesus. If you're here tonight and you don't know whether or not you're right with God, you don't know if you were to die tomorrow where you would go, and you want to be right with God, it is very simple. It is very easy. Turn from your sin. Turn from trusting in your own ways. Turn from being your own God and doing the things we know, we inherently we know because we're thinking of those things right now. Make the decision in your heart. Plant your flag in the ground tonight. I'm going to turn away from those things and I'm going to turn to God. If you want to make that decision tonight, if you want to give your life for Jesus, if you don't want to be like how Mallory was where she said she was one foot in, one foot out, and you want to go all in for Jesus tonight and, and know that you're right with God by the end of the night, this is the invitation because this is what the Bible says. It says, repent from your sin, turn to God, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And so you're going to have an opportunity to do that. The second thing that we're going to offer is prayer for anyone that needs healing. Anyone who needs healing. If you have an issue in your body, physical issue, illness, chronic injury, pain, anything, you need healing in your body. We're gonna give you an opportunity to receive prayer 
and God is going to heal your body tonight in the name of Jesus. And then the last thing that we're going to offer, the last opportunity, is if you've been, if, you, if you're a Christian, if you follow God, but you've been living your life dull, spiritually bored, compromised, maybe you're dabbling in sin, you're, you're, you really want to live for God, but you're struggling, like you're not pursuing and promoting a lifestyle of sin, you just have a few things that you're just struggling so hard to get rid of, you want to live for God, you want to, you, you want to live uh, the life that you know you're called to, but you just feel like you lack the power. We're going to give you the opportunity to receive prayer, and our leaders are going to pray for you, and the Bible promises that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be a witness for Jesus. You'll go from being a cultural Christian church attender to being a witness for Jesus, where your life impacts others for Jesus, where he speaks to people through you, where he touches people through you, where people's lives are changed by God through you. That's what his word promises. And so Sebastian is going to give his testimony. And I'm going to say this. If at any point you want to respond to those three, if you need one of those three things, and I'm going to ask the people in the front, can we actually step like back? Like, I know there's not a lot of room. I'm sorry. Behind the, uh, the tanks here. We're going to take this front part of the grass and we're going to make this into an altar. Anything can be an altar if your heart's in the right place. And while Sebastian is sharing his testimony, if you want to go all in for Jesus, you want to give your life to Jesus and get right with God. If you need healing for your body or you want to receive the power of the Holy Spirit that's been promised to us, I'm going to ask that you step out into the aisle and that you walk down to the altar. And after Sebastian is done sharing his testimony, you can even come now. After Sebastian is done sharing his testimony, we're going to pray for you. We're going to baptize you. We're going to pray for the sick. We're going to pray for you to receive power. You're going to have a God encounter tonight, Tam UCC. Are you ready for a God encounter tonight? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That when you hear what he's done in the past, it's a prophecy of what he'll do in the future. What he's done for them, he will do for you. We had to share the truth. We had to open our mouths. We had to share the word. It's the only thing that builds faith, that gives God room to move. So everything that's happened tonight is building up to this. You can come in front of the tanks. I want you to, if you're responding, come in front of the tanks. So we know that you're responding. Keep coming. There's more. Keep coming. And if you're, if you're not responding, that's okay. Let's give them room. Let's give these guys room. The Lord is here tonight. He's about to move. Let's go. What's up, guys? Uh, y'all got time for one more testimony? Okay. All right, man, I want to make this quick, man, because I feel the spirit in this place. Um, this story starts my junior year. So I was a Durr for two years. Go Durrs. And then uh, shout out my <laughs> UTRGV family. Let me hear you real quick. <laughs> yeah, we got people all the way from another school, man. Two hours, man. And my Houston people, we love you, too. Thank you for coming. Woo! All right, all right. So two years at this university, gorgeous university. Then I, then I transfer to UTRGV, man. And it's my junior year. I remember coming to one night, it's powerful, it's right here. And guys, I came alone, I came alone. And I just remember leaving. I remember leaving in my car and I'm like, wow, what a powerful night, what a powerful night. And I just felt this burden on me. The Lord put it on me and he was just like, don't ever come to this event alone ever again. So I remember my senior year as uh, some of my Vaqueros are here. Uh, man, the Lord provided 35 people from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley to come down here. It was powerful. And that wasn't even the coolest part. So they come, two people get baptized. It was, it was beautiful. I had some friends just receive prayer uh, for their backs. 
they weren't in complete healing, but they experienced some type of healing. And, and we go back, guys. We, we go back to school. And about two weeks after, we have Meet You at the Pole. And, and not everybody can make it, but we start with eight, guys. We start around, we start with around eight people. And we had some worship. Uh, it was gorgeous. And I just remember praying. And we were with eight people. And the Lord was saying to me, hey, let's, let's send out two at a time. And guys, we just start going around campus. And, and if you don't know what uh, Meet You at the Pole is, that, that was the, that day. It's just like a national day of prayer. And we start walking around campus, finding people. And we double our numbers. I think we had like 22, 23. It was powerful. And that was just a start. So then the uh, year goes on. Christmas comes around. New Year's comes back. And I have a friend named Lola. She's not here. We love Lola, though. Um, but we come back. And she just confesses to me. It's one of the first testimonies. I'm, I'm right back on campus. And she was just like, Sebastian, I had this crazy revelation. And I was like, talk to me. And she was just saying, Sebastian, I just, I felt it in my spirit. The Lord was like, you're either cold or you're hot. You're either all in for me or you're not with me at all. And she just confessed that she was like, Sebastian, I was so lukewarm. I was so lukewarm, but I know now that I'm a child of God. I know that I'm a child of God. And she said it so beautifully, so with so much confidence. And I just remember her telling me that. And I was like, wow. And I got to baptize her at, a, at our local church. It was powerful. And then she tells me about all this persecution she was experiencing, you know, low levels of persecution, but just being on the bus. And, and, and I know some of my buddies here have experienced it as well. And, and people are telling her, what, you think you're better than me? You know, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you acting different? Why aren't you sleeping around anymore? Why'd you cut those guys off? And, and Lola's like, I'm a child of God. My hands, my hands are clean. The blood of Christ covers me. And this is the last thing I want to say. Last thing I want to say, because the Holy Spirit was moving and is still moving through Miss uh, Lonnie. We bless you and, and thank you for leading FCA. Um, but guys, last night, last night around where that stage is at right there with the cameras, I'm on my hands and my knees, guys. And, and, and I know the Lord wants me to share this. I have uh, Nolan and Yanni praying for me, and I just fall. I fall. I'm on my hands and my knees, and the Lord shows me every time that I've prayed in Miramar, which y'all know where Miramar is, or Aspen. Now it's the cottages, and I remember every time I was on my hands and my knees, and I'm telling God, I'm, I have no hope. I'm useless. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, Lord, and I, I can't find a way out. Lord, I'm, I'm done. Why, why am I even living? I, I call myself this, this baseball player, this, you know, what am I really? And I just feel like I have an Isaiah moment. I'm just, I'm a man of unclean lips. And guys, I didn't have this moment just once. The Lord was showing me multiple times, even at UR, UTRGV, where I was just on my hands and knees crying out to the Lord, I need you. And the Lord was sh showing me kind of like a ripple effect of just all the time since I was a kid that the Lord was right there and his hand was stretched out to me. And I'm saying this because I know a lot of people here, man, are being robbed of the joy of their salvation because they're convicted and they haven't, they haven't made a step of obedience yet. I want to read this scripture. The Bible says in Matthew 5.30, reading from the CSB version, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Guys, there's times in our lives where we talk to females, where we, talk, where we dabble in alcohol, where we, where, where we just do all these things, and then we ask the Lord, why am I still struggling? It's because you won't let go of it. You won't cut it off. And the Lord's asking you to just step out in obedience right now. So if that's you, will you step out? Maybe you've been robbed of joy of your salvation. You need to step out. The Lord's calling you home. He wants you home. His desire is to, for you to be whole, not broken on the floor. He wants you whole. It could be alcohol. It could be depression. Maybe you have a plan to go to a party tomorrow night. You need to cut that. Cut that off. Come. Come. The Lord wants to meet you where you're at. Come. Come. And guys, the Lord was, was touching me touching me on the floor and it was the first time I'm, I'm not even kidding that I was ever on my hands and my knees and I'm just thankful I was like wow Lord you really can make me whole all these people all these testimonies I've heard that you've saved them you know, <laughs> now you've saved me completely 
And that's not to say there's a struggle, guys, but there is, there is a time where the Lord asks you to step out, and I know there's more. And, it, and, it, and it's by faith. <laughs> you don't really know what tomorrow holds. And like PM says, but he's already been there. Tomorrow is, is God's yesterday. So guys, God, God has your future. So I just ask right now, can we, ju- can we just bow our heads real quick just for a quick prayer? Lord, I just pray for this place. I pray for people that came from Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, all these places, Lord, all these freshmen, Father, maybe they're in PSA, Lord, and they're questioning, Lord, why'd you bring me here? Why am I not in College Station? Why am I not in a different? Lord, it's because you want them here right now, and you're calling them home, Jesus. This is what you died for, Jesus, that your sons and daughters would come home, the prodigals. The ones that are so full of shame that they can't even share their testimony. Lord, you're calling them home. Lord, you don't want something that just dies off, Lord. You want this to go back to the families, to the friends, Lord. Something that lasts for an eternity, guys. Guys, this life is so short. The Lord, he wants to redeem you, but you have to let him. You got to step out. I know this isn't the most famous preaching whatever you want to call it but the Lord's calling you home guys and if you're nervous and you're scared that you're just gonna mess up again come because that's a lie from the enemy he can set you free and set you free for good you don't have to dabble anymore you don't have to run to these things to these devices no he can make you whole so I just pray right now Lord would you silence the voice of the enemy Lord so these children father can come home that they can be made whole made righteous father because they've tried we've tried so much lord and we keep messing up so lord would you grab our hand and bring us to the altar lord we just thank you lord in your beautiful name we pray amen